Thanks for joining us for this special edition of Discovering Victory. Today we're going to be having a conversation about a very important topic, and that topic is trauma. Joining me today are two of our staff members. Dr. Lynn Johns is the director of Barber's Place, and Melissa Smith is the director of Women of Character. And it might be good for uh, our listeners to just have a little bit about your background. Tell us about you and uh, what you do here at America's Keswick and how God's prepared you for that role, Lynn and then Melissa. Well, I'm the director of Barber's Place, which is our women's addiction program. But uh, prior to that, I have done uh, a lot of individual counseling as well as working in both the college setting with women and then in um, a mission organization out in Ohio. And just in my history and all my experience working with women and uh, those, especially the homeless, you can just, when you hear their stories, you just hear stories of life that when you hear it, you just go, how can anybody survive mm. that and not be messed up? Mm. And so that made me just spend more and more time kind of really delving into the impact and how it translates today. And, and we'll talk later about how much of an impact uh, the pain and the abuse of our past plays into um, potentially becoming an addict of some sort. Mm. Yeah. You know, my heart for trauma ministry uh, really is born out of personal experience first and foremost. Uh, I remember I lost my favorite uncle and my mother uh, within a two-month two period, and I remember when I got the news that my uncle died, I went berserk. I, I just went out of my mind and screaming and carrying on. Two months later when I found out my mother had um, passed away, uh, I just shut down. I was numb, frozen, dead inside. And, you know, uh, I faced ramifications of those losses um, for weeks and months and even years afterwards. So uh, first and foremost, a personal experience. Uh, I was a police officer for eight years mm -hmm. and just seeing, you know, the, uh, the things that people go through, domestic violence, um, accidents, um, seeing loved ones, as Lynn mentioned, struggling with um, drugs and addiction and um, also, I have had, uh, you know, many family members that have struggled with uh, personal traumas and uh, are still grappling with the effects of that. So, you know, all of that uh, kind of positioned me when the Lord opened the door for me to be here, you know, to have a heart for trauma ministry, um, having been counseled that way myself, and then also um, just kind of wanted being a conduit of God's grace in the lives of other hurting people, and I've been doing that for a little over three years here. So let's start at Melissa. Why don't you define for us what is trauma? Yeah, well, you know, trauma has Greek origins coming um, from the Greek, and it means wounds. So, you know, we know that there's wound centers for uh, people who have uh, physical wounds, um, burns or, or uh, breaks, um, but there's also soul wounds. And these are wounds that uh, we incur through uh, interactions um, or events with uh, interactions with people where there's uh, toxic negative emotion, where we are hurt, where we are uh, distressed, maybe something that's happened to us, maybe something we have observed happen to someone else, uh, someone we love, or maybe if we're in a, a helping profession or even just an innocent bystander at an event. Um, but it's a soul wound. And, you know, so along with that strong negative emotion, usually in terms of fear, helplessness, powerlessness, maybe. Um, disgust, um, things along that line, what happens is also is that uh, we begin to develop core um, beliefs around things that we need, like we need to be safe, we need to belong, uh, we need to have value and purpose. And so uh, if we uh, encounter an event where uh, we are violated or where we're injured and now uh, we have this core need to be safe and now I don't feel safe, you know, for example, um, January of 2016, we had an attempted break-in at my house. And so, you know, dealing with that as a, a police officer going on a call with a break-in, you kind of expect to encounter that kind of stuff. I didn't expect to encounter it. It was the coldest night in January. It was the night before I was doing the trauma group here for um, Barbara's place. And, you know, uh, I then had to deal with feeling unsafe for uh, several weeks, especially after the event. So strong emotion, losses are generated, and sometimes then, um, lies about God, the world, others, ourselves are um, kind of encrypted and then follow us and will, in a sense, maybe um, inform the way we live and, and we can get caught up into certain behaviors and, and patterns. One of the things I love about what 
the two of you have brought to the ministry here in America's Keswick is to help us understand that there is a correlation between trauma and addiction. Lynn, help us understand how that all plays together. Well, as we, we talked before, that, that just seems there's a lot of stories, and it's really hard for most of us to survive any time without having experienced some sort of trauma, loss, crime. Uh, you know, I remember being robbed as a kid, the same thing, afraid mm. to sleep at night, but yeah. just so many things that, and that happen to us that we don't have the ability to process that information early on, and so it changes who we are. So trauma, one we've experienced, really changes our perspective about ourselves. It changes our perspective about life, changes our perspective about others, uh, about safety, uh, and it even changes our perspective on God often. Uh, and so it makes it then difficult to cope with life um, after we've had the trauma. And if there's a, a bunch of trauma, it makes it, it just repeats itself. Uh, and the brain is so much involved uh, in our response to trauma. And there's so many studies out there that could, you know, be a whole other topic. But the brain over engages, uh, you know, and, and shuts down one part overextends the emotional side, shuts down the, uh, the thinking side in a trauma. And so what we spend the rest of our time doing often is self-medicating against the negative symptoms, against all those strong emotions that are brought to life, like, you know, boom, all of a sudden. And uh, so that's anxiety, fear, insomnia, irritability, constant state of agitation. And then you have those negative, the, the feelings of guilt that it might have happened or mm -hmm. uh, that I caused it, a shame if in some way I participated or felt responsible, self-blame, uh, oftentimes, you know, um, if I survive and someone else doesn't. Uh, and so all of that takes place. And so the need to self-medicate uh, just becomes uh, big and large to help with concentration, focus, numbing the pain, the sadness, and just getting through life. And it can start out with doctor-prescribed pills, but just explodes then uh, into addictions. And, you know, and, and the studies are out there that show two-thirds of uh, people that are in treatment uh, for drug abuse were abused as children. Mm. Uh, we have, uh, I always quote that, you know, that 75% of survivors of any kind of abuse are probably going to be an addiction. And, you know, historically, I want to say it's, it's larger than that by the time they actually end up in treatment. Uh, and then, you know, even if you don't take the big traumas that happen, you know, there are those little ones, accidents, major illnesses, natural dis disasters, 33% of the people that go through those often then struggle with addiction. So it's really hard to have that kind of trauma or pain and not go into and need something to anesthetize and help us through if we have no other way or idea or can't express it or people don't understand. Um, and one of the biggest problems with addiction then is addiction dulls the memory of the trauma which then it becomes hidden behind the addiction. And so, so many get treated for addiction and they're never treated for the mm. trauma because the trauma has been hidden by the addiction. Uh, and it's really important that we, we become a trauma-informed program so that we almost make the assumption that everybody coming in probably has had a trauma that needs to be addressed or we need to help them find, discover, and express. Mm. Lynn, you talk about the big traumas like war, rape, and abuse. I mean, we're recording this the day after a tragedy, a very horrible tragedy in Manhattan. But, but there may be other trauma sources that we don't necessarily think about. What, what would some of those be? Okay, let me start by breaking it down into almost two um, headings of trauma. And one would be the one we've all heard about is PTSD. It's, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is kind of a common word today. But when you think about PTSD, that is trauma around usually isolated events. Um, that would be trauma, which would be rape or if they were in a war, like a specific battle that they were in. 
Uh, but it is also the victim of a crime. That would be PTSD. That would be the witness of a horrific event. Those that witnessed the event or participated in the event yesterday, they, you know, I heard some of the interviews and the people mm. are obviously in shock. Mm. They're going to have a hard time thinking about it or getting through. Um, natural disasters. We are survivors of Sandy. There are people that are still living uh, in storm um, fear. I, there is somebody that I know that every time a bad storm happens, the storm we had this week, I get a text. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be as bad? Who's going to come get me? And it just triggers all those memories from that event. Um, a single physical assault, you know, uh, being robbed or mugged um, can happen or, you know, even pushed or shoved for some people. Uh, you know, and then there's being involved in a, a deadly or serious car accident where you barely escape with your life or you spent a whole lot of time uh, in the hospital. I mean, anybody who's been in an accident knows mm. the residual effect of right. driving afterwards. And so you think if, you know, that kind of rubs into all different areas and then, um, and then any kind of a serious physical illness that someone may have, there's just that residual or having overcome tr uh, cancer. There's that living with that constant fear um, and, and just has a residual hypervigilant effect. Uh, and that's PTSD, kind of one-time events or one thing. And then there's complex trauma. Uh, I think this is what we often see a lot here, but complex trauma is where the person has been controlled or dominated or their safety has been taken away for a longer period of time. So this would be your child abuse. This would be, you know, those hostages that are coming back that were getting released mm. after months. Um, POWs, the residual effect of being a prisoner of war. Uh, those that have been taken into religious cults uh, and then they're rescued out. That would be complex trauma. Uh, gang membership uh, is a form mm. of control and abuse that takes time to kind of unravel. Uh, domestic violence, where you're living in it constantly. Um, and then there's uh, grief due to sudden loss or critical because it happens over time uh, or repeated loss mm -hmm. uh, because it's been more than once um, being fed, bullying, living as a kid for years in elementary school, maybe being bullied or high school, um, an unstable home environment where it is emotionally withdrawn, un, uh, taken care of, maybe very impoverished. Uh, and just living constantly in a state of crisis. Mm -hmm. That's complex trauma, and that just feeds and feeds and feeds like snowball effect uh, until it pretty much makes you always be in a state of, um, we like to use the word hypervigilance, that, you know, a lot of us sit around waiting for the next shoe to drop. They just mm -hmm. assume the shoe is dropping every day. Uh, and so it's a, it's a hard way to live, but so you have the the trauma that is sort of a one-time event, not packaged with others, and then that which is just accumulated mm -hmm. weight. So, Melissa, yeah. probably somebody that's listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. they're listening to what you and Lynn have shared, and yeah. all of a sudden in their mind, the light bulb's clicking off, wait a minute. How would a person know that they have been impacted by trauma themselves? Yeah, you know, and just like we talked about how it's a wound and we compared it to a, a physical wound, um, there's uh, degrees of severity, you know, when we're dealing with trauma. So uh, on the more severe end of the scale, Dr. Johns, you know, spoke to some of those things uh, where a person may have, uh, a, a, it's more these subconsciously spawned behaviors that a person isn't necessarily thinking, okay, I'm going to get startled, you know, uh, so they're going to have anxiety. Uh, probably panic attacks, um, uh, hypervigilance, hyperarousal, uh, startle response um, that is easily triggered. Um, there's intrusive symptoms such as um, flashbacks, uh, nightmares, night terrors, these, these gripping, terrible dreams that uh, someone, you know, almost feels like they can't wake up from. Uh, even intrusive and obsessive thoughts. Um, and so, and some, some of the other responses can look more like avoidance, um, withdrawing, isolating from people, withdrawing, isolating from triggers or environmental cues related 
to the trauma, you know, because what happens is that um, traumatic event indelibly encrypts all the information from the event in the person's mind. So sensory data, certain smells, sights, sounds, you know, maybe it was a bright sunny day, maybe it was cold, uh, any of that gets wrapped up in the whole package which we call the trigger and so that gets stored so that person might want to you know avoid something that's going to not consciously remind them of the trauma but subconsciously remind them of the trauma and kind of on the lesser end of the scale kind of speaking to you know grief and loss and things that we're all going to go through um, neglect rejection hurts and pains uh, that's where maybe someone's experiencing a disconnect a disconnect from what they know intellectually and what they feel emotionally. Uh, you know, they might say to their, their spouse, you know, you don't love me, you don't love me. Uh, they may, uh, you know, feel very unsafe and, and get caught up in behaviors that just don't match and fit the particular situation or uh, level of life. You know, again, things revolving around safety or significance or value, belonging, um, something else. Two is just basically having worked with a lot of people at this point, um, when people have been through something, a loss or a death, and they've never really talked to anyone, that's one of the things I ask, who have you talked uh, to about this? Um, have you cried? Have you grieved? You know, because there's certain core things that need to happen, that those shades of anger, shades of sadness. Sharing our story, either some people prefer through writing, some people prefer through speaking, you know, but these are some things that if they haven't shared their pain, if they haven't grieved, if they haven't been able to get perspective, not necessarily accept what happened, but accept that it happened, these are all kind of different cues and signs that maybe they're dealing with um, unresolved trauma or loss. So you've unpacked a little bit about uh, some of the effects of trauma and helping people identify what trauma is all about. What, what are the factors that influence how a person responds to trauma? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think I'm going to answer it by giving two examples. Uh, we've heard of a tale of two cities. We'll call this a tale of two ladies. Let's say a woman, um, you know, is walking uh, to the Mac machine and she gets attacked. She gets mugged. Um, she's got a cell phone. Um, somebody in the bank sees it. The police respond immediately. Um, the guy is uh, apprehended soon after. Uh, she goes home to a house where she has a husband who's uh, present, who cares, who's engaged. Um, you know, she's got health insurance that uh, offers counseling sessions that are affordable. Uh, she's plugged in at her church, has good support, gets cards and calls from people. Um, that she's connected with and and so uh, you know she may not have the need to uh, professionally process what she's been through but she's processing it with her family with her friends uh, with her uh, safe people and let's kind of contrast that to the lady who same situation but uh, maybe she lives in the city and the police response is uh, delayed she um, comes home to an empty house um, and then, uh, or maybe we could say she has children that are depending on her, so she's not only able to, not able to process what she's been through, she's taking care of other people. Um, so Lynn was talking about post-traumatic stress, you know, and there's post-traumatic stress, and then there's post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we all kind of experience stress and, and negative effects when we've been through something, but uh, in, a, in a healthy way, if we're able to, to calm down and process that, it doesn't turn into what's the actual, you know, disorder in a sense. So, uh, you know, and another, let's say that this second woman has um, mental illness or, or previous uh, mental health issues that she's struggling with. Um, and maybe the, the, the guy's never caught or if he is caught, uh, he gets off on a technicality through the court system. So you can just see how many factors interpersonally, you know, intrapersonally within the person, in their environment, um, at home, their environment in a sense of where they live and just the, the overall response and, and all these factors can kind of interplay and really, so let's say, take a level four trauma and make it a level eight experientially mm -hmm. or really take a level four trauma and, you know, within a month or two, um, that's resolved, which would be like the case with me with the attempted break-in. This is something that had been resolved, you know, because uh, a lot of positive factors were in place. Lynn, uh, the theme for next year at America's Keswick is Unleashing Hope. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and that just keeps going over and over in my mind. And, and what I love about what we're able to do here at America's Keswick through our Addiction Recovery Ministries is to provide hope. Uh, what can be done to help someone process or heal from mm. trauma? Mm. Well, I think giving hope and for helping them find hope and finding that there is a bigger story and uh, helping someone do that is is really key. And, and I think Melissa did a good job, uh, especially of talking about the need that we do best when we have a safe place and we have support. Uh, and so if we know somebody or if it's us personally, it's really key that we find support, uh, that we find a safe person because we have to be able to tell our story. Uh, when I have people that come in and say, you know, I have never told anybody this, mm -hmm. and I find out it happened 35 years mm -hmm. ago, you just can hear how that has just relived. And often just telling the story and having someone hear it and tell them how awful that must be mm -hmm. neutralizes mm -hmm. a lot of the bigger emotions and the, the blame. So we have to be able to tell our story. We have to find somebody that's safe, that, you know, kind of comforts. You know, God calls us to comfort others with the comfort we've been given. And, and hopefully we can be that to other people also, uh, because we can't heal from that which we can't talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is all, the trauma makes us, you know, hold it in, as I said before, that, that the thinking side of our brain, the part that processes the information, is often shut down and the emotions are highlighted. So the sooner we start bringing those two together, uh, the better we are to kind of neutralize and be able to tell the story differently. It's also important to find stability, find a way to make sure that, you know, our whole life doesn't continually unravel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yesterday I heard a lady, she was totally distraught and she says, well, I can't talk right now. I have to go get my kids. Mm -hmm. And so it just, you know, there's probably going to be no stability the rest of her night, but it's going to be important that we find stability if we're in, if, if we're in an abusive relationship to get out of that relationship to be able to process it. Uh, find balance, whether it's eating right, healthy, because those are the kind of things that we don't always do well when we are under stress. Most of us don't eat well when we're under stress. So... Uh, and if there's an addiction that goes with it, you know, get the help for the addiction first because the two need to either go together or, as I said before, you can't deal with the trauma if you are still mm. have all the other things going on to get to the um, heart of the pain. Uh, educate yourself. Educate yourself on the symptoms. There are tests online that you can just take to kind of find out if you're curious is this my problem? You can look, and there's a lot of different ways to just kind of mm. find out uh, some of those things and, you know, get involved in a church. Um, you know, find healing from God. I know that there's probably a lot of distortions, so find the truth about God. Find out really who he is. Find about his view of this world, the suffering, the evil, why it exists. Get some of those answers answered. Mm. Uh, they really help pull the pieces together. Um, and, and give us a, a good groundwork and a foundation. Um, and, you know, trauma work can be done first, you know, with peers and family and mm -hmm. just by telling the story and then, you know, probably reading and work on your own. But you may need to get yourself in a group. Maybe it's a grief group or, a, mm -hmm. you know, a trauma group or a support group for people that have been through different situations. Uh, there are a lot of different kind of groups out there that exist. Um, or you may need to do it individually with a professional counselor who can really be sensitive to that and walk yeah. through that. But I think the biggest thing that I encourage everyone not to do is don't say, well, that happened, I'll be fine. Um, because that's rarely the truth. And saying that it never does just go away. Yeah. Um, time does not heal yeah. all wounds. We know that, uh, but we want to believe that if I just keep telling myself it didn't happen or it's not a big deal. Uh, and if you're telling yourself that, that probably means you need to go talk to somebody yeah. about it. This is a special edition of Discovering Victory, and I'm happy today to have Dr. Lynn Johns and Melissa Smith, who serve with Barber's Place and Women of Character. And we'll be talking about trauma uh, millennials get a lot of bad rap for lots of different things, but one of the things that has impressed me as I've intersected with young leaders and, 
and, and hearing their stories. They, they don't seem to be afraid to, to reach out for help and, and talk about the tough issues. My dad's generation, and probably even my generation, we, we buried and stuff, we didn't talk about it. So somebody may be listening today and they are in the throes of this and we've talked about the hope that we can provide through what Jesus Christ can do in a life. Maybe Lynn if you and Melissa, you could share one or two examples of folks that you've worked with that you've seen them set free because of their willingness to address this topic in their lives. And I think that's uh, the willingness factor is often interesting because what I do with addiction recovery, they come in thinking they're going to deal with their addiction, and then we're trying to get them to also deal with their um, their trauma, which you know we call it past pain processing, uh, because the the big T word seems so much more threatening and fearful. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the fact that we all have pain and we all have past pain. Uh, it ultimately we. Ultimately, they end up talking about it and using the term trauma, but it's the class, it's the thing they like to do the least. But in the end, it often is the one that they say, you know, these classes help, but that was sort of the, the turning point. And often it's just going back and unpacking um, hurts and pains and fears that they just think are theirs to own for the rest of their lives. And we help them shed them not make them their identity and they get to walk away believing that they don't have to be who they've always been uh, and we talk about transformation mm. and for so long it is because of their abuse especially abuse when they have a history of abuse that they just believe that that's who they are they're never going to be any different so they constantly make choices based on that and yet you know so many have just when they all of a sudden realize that isn't who they are, it's what happened to them. Mm. It's an experience they had rather than their identity. Then they get to be, all of a sudden break free to make different decisions because they're making them out of a new identity, a new belief about themselves, a new belief about the potential to live. And so those especially that come out of child abuse, but I think some of the others is, is we've had, we have had some women who have, uh, lost people in their lives, children especially, or siblings in very, very traumatic, painful, hurtful uh, ways that none of us would walk away from without being angry and bitter and just have residual dreams about and fears about. And uh, the forgiveness and the freedom when you see them come to terms with that and deal with it um, on both a spiritual level and intellectual level mm -hmm. and an emotional level. Uh, you can just see all of a sudden it's like they're they're lighter, they're happier, um, and that has been um, I think one of the the best things is you can almost see when they have finally taken off some of the the clothing of living as a victim, always a victim, and uh, I've caused it. Uh, to start living as a first a survivor mm. uh, but then one who knows <clears throat> and is ready to give back and to talk about it we see that here we see that when they first come and we ask them to give their testimony they don't mention it mm. and then you can tell by the end they're actually saying out loud in front of many mm. things that they could never even say out loud to themselves uh, and you just see that they have just shed the shame and the embarrassment um, it's not that they want to talk about it all the time, but you just see that they are no longer living with this deep, dark secret, mm. um, and there's freedom in that. Yeah, that oil of joy that replaces the spirit of heaviness, mm -hmm. which is an integral part of Christ's ministry and our ministry as the body of Christ, being his hands and feet, his shoulder, uh, ears. Um, you know, a lot of what you said uh, is just rings so true, Lynn. And, you know, I've worked with over 50 people at this point with trauma. And to just um, be able to see God's truth set them free. And, again, it's as we access that emotional part, that emotional part that's hidden and closed off, and it's accessed in safe relationship. And so now they can kind of revisit these memories, but in a, a, a good context of safety and warmth and acceptance and also very like I'm very 
careful that that person is is often in charge of you know if they're going to work on this or if they're going to read this today because uh, trauma is so disempowering that they they need to feel a sense of control uh, over what they're doing you know or in, or in essence they can be in a sense re-traumatized but I think about one particular person I worked with um, who was a sexual abuse survivor and this person couldn't make eye contact um, was extremely jittery was not able to focus um, you did, you couldn't touch this person you know without making this person uncomfortable and I just let the person know uh, I give hugs but they have to be um, wanted and that you know you can let me know that, that if and when you want one well you know at w weeks and months later that you know the person would grip me up on a weekly basis and, mm. and, and get that that hug you know uh, but just what's amazing is and I, I we always want to be careful to be general enough because we I don't want to um, be able to identify who I'm talking about but this you know I know that God is using this person in such amazing ways and um, that this person's testimony and ministry is enhanced because of the that uh, you know Isaiah 45 3 those treasures of darkness this person was able to get uh, through the experience you know A.W. Tozer calls it the, the night ministry mm -hmm. or the, you know uh, we know desert experiences all different names for that going through the valley of the shadow and coming through changed but ultimately better you know and a, a tool for the Lord to use mm -hmm. what would you say how would you encourage a spouse who may have a spouse who's in the midst of trauma like they they may not have a clue what to do to help their mate what, what would you encourage them to do well I would encourage them to get help and get some understanding and get some support to be able to help them uh, find their own strength their own emotional understanding and for them to uh, understand what is available so that they're not going out there to do it and try to bring this person alone but yeah. to be able to offer to team up to take two uh, oftentimes, I think as spouses and family members, we think we're the ones that have to do the work, and oftentimes we're the one that has to do the legwork <laughs> to be able to give the information, to give the love, the support, to not feed the condemnation, but mm -hmm. to help them talk about it, uh, to help them express and not let them close off, uh, and to, to, to point them in the right direction or go with them. You know, oftentimes, especially the grief groups or some of the groups the first time is, is you know, we we bring somebody if that's how you need to come and and come through this together, uh, join up uh, really and, and start praying and, and getting the body of Christ to pray, pray with them, pray for them, mm -hmm. uh, intercede for them, because the Holy Spirit can do the work if we are there constantly showing them that we care. They will come around and say, OK. I'm ready to do this. Yeah, I love the balance in that, you know, doing our part and not confusing that with God's part. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, being a, a, a stable, secure, healthy, uh, grounded in Christ, in one's identity in Christ as a spouse, knowing not to take that behavior personally, mm -hmm. responding well, not reacting. Uh, that was one of the big game changers is when I addressed my trauma, you know, uh, my husband was very happy about that because, you know, I was getting triggered and I was reacting uh, from things in, from that I went through, you know, and so um, that would dovetails with what you said, but just uh, we can only do our part, you know, and then to know um, to educate that person and just to be a safe place to care, uh, to minister to our spouse um, in the ways that God calls us to. Mm -hmm. So we witnessed in this area the, the devastation of Sandy, and obviously we've just talked about earlier in the podcast the event that took place in Manhattan. These are questions not on the, the yeah. list, not my spiritual gift. We've noticed that. Yeah, but so like <laughs> I don't think this terror stuff is going to go away. I mean, I think this is be going to become more and more a part of the world that we live in, which is obviously going to be very traumatic for folks. How, how, do we, how do we deal with that? How do we help people process through stuff like this well, I think it's really important and, and this is one of the new classes that we're teaching at Barbara's place is that God from the beginning has told us that in this world we will have tribulation <clears throat> mm -hmm. that the world is only going to get more difficult evil exists from the beginning of time if you read scripture mm -hmm. 
man has been out to take over man, one country out to dominate another. Uh, people with vendettas and their own issues are taking them out on everybody else. I mean, just reading the Bible, mm -hmm. we can see that nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet what God continually says is, but I'm going to be with you in it, through it, mm -hmm. uh, in spite of it. And I'm going to show you that. And, and he talks about the fact, don't grieve as if you have no hope. Yeah. Um, grieve, hate it, dislike it. Mm -hmm but realize that our hope and our hope alone is in what God is going to do in the end. Uh, and that someday he is really gonna make mm -hmm. all this new. Until then, he literally promises us that we have to live in the fact that we live in a world that is difficult, but it's in those difficulties that we can go out and say, hey, this world is hard, but we've got the answer. If this world was a piece of cake, if this world had no problems, mm -hmm. nobody would need our Savior. And so we have, in the midst of all this, the avenue to go and say, we have what you need to walk mm -hmm. through this. You know, and, and that great footprints thing where it says, you know, it's in that time where we feel helpless and feel like we're falling apart, where God becomes most alive and real, and we know that it's not in our strength. And I mean, I would, that's so key that we mm. understand what the Bible says about living in this world and what this world is really going to be like, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we can't take others where we haven't been ourselves. So I think uh, what Lynn's saying is, you know, we need to avail ourselves of all levels of help, you know, and we do that here at America's Keswick, support groups for grief, support groups to come alongside people who are struggling with the aftermath of addiction in the lives of their children or their spouses or their loved ones. Um, and, and also just the fact that we have count the counseling groups available, um, doing our own work, and then being available for the Lord to use us uh, as conduits of his mercy and healing grace. You know, uh, we're stewards of the grace of God, and we're ministers of the grace of God, Ephesians 4.29, 1 Peter 4.10. Um, and, and the darker the night, you know, the brighter the light. Mm. And I know for me that suffering is just has a real purifying effect. Um, and those things that we hold on to, you know, it's, it strips us of our, our self-will. And, and, you know, Jesus clearly says if we're to be his disciple, if, uh, we, have to, we have to deny ourselves. We have to die to ourselves. Um, and although God obviously doesn't uh, engineer sin and doesn't cause sin or tempt anyone to sin, um, you know, it's a tragic part of the equation now. Yet in his majesty and uh, amazing goodness that he weaves it all, you know, like a tapestry. We don't understand what's going on on the back side, on the flip side. Wow, mm. this is beautiful. And this can be displayed um, for the, the glory of the creator, the one who weaved it in a sense. If somebody wanted to learn a little bit more about trauma, what are some of the resources that you can recommend to our friends? Well, I would just suggest that you just go right on our website. We have uh, a flyer that is available, uh, a brochure that was written that uh, you can get your hands on, uh, both in hard copy and online, as well as uh, more in-depth information that gives a little more statistics and data and some educational components. Uh, and also on our website, we have some uh, <clears throat> books that we recommend and suggestions uh, to kind of look at for perusing and educating yourself, uh, as well as the fact that you are always welcome to call either one of us mm -hmm. and we will point you in the right direction, mm -hmm. uh, try to help you uh, discern even what is a good place and where is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have groups that are available on this property. Yeah. Uh, so feel free to give us a call. We'll try to point you in the right direction, but you know, I always go read up, pray up, mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of seek. And you'll find. Okay, so if somebody wants to reach out to you, how can they do that? I'll give I'll give Melissa's <laughs> phone number. Uh, no, you can call the the Keswick number and 732-350-1187, uh, and they will get you to one of us. Uh, but that number will get you to both of us. So. So I encourage you to visit our website www.americaskeswick.org. As Lynn said, there will be resources on our website. There will be a transformation resource on the topic of trauma. And then Melissa has put together a more in-depth look at what that looks like. And so I want to encourage you to go to the website, 
www.americaskezik.org. I want to thank Dr. Johns and Melissa for joining us today, mm -hmm. having a conversation at a very, about a very difficult mm -hmm. subject. We appreciate you joining us, mm -hmm. and we hope that you'll continue to help us discover victory.